Welcome to another episode of the B2B Leadership Podcast. My name is Nils Vinya, and today my guest is Catherine Blackmore. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Looking oh, forward my to pleasure. chatting with you about, I think, our favorite topic. I, I We were just chatting about that right before. This, this <laughs> leadership is absolutely 100% our favorite topic. Now, we've known each other since like, what, 2013, 2014? So going on oh, yeah. long, long, long time. And yes. we've had so many chats about this. I can't wait to share some of those stories with this audience and let them hear about your incredible experience. Oh, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. A pleasure. All right. So before we jump into the, you know, going back in time and looking at mm-hmm. everything from a leadership perspective, tell us a little bit about your role today, who you're working for, and the type of work that you are involved with. Absolutely. So I am group vice president of customer success at Oracle, and I have an operating job of taking care of our customers who are our SaaS customers. And that represents our fusion suites of product, Um, We also have, you know, our non-fusion acquired companies that are a part of our application suite. Um, But basically think about anything that is an application in the cloud. That's that's what I'm responsible for at Oracle to ensure that all of our SaaS customers get to value, are successful and satisfied. So that's for North America. But I also have responsibility for, I know we'll probably get into a little bit about it, but also a global concern we have around making sure our service and how we deliver success to our customers is standard. So I help facilitate that for the globe, bringing together all of our regions to make sure, again, that we are delivering customer success as a practice at Oracle consistently for that important customer experience. Wow. And on a worldwide scale, too. Like That's (laughs) going to be some of the fun stuff because that is not a job you come across every day. When you're talking about one of the world's largest software companies, uh, one of the most successful companies in the world, and the scale of the products and services that you manage. That's absolutely fascinating. Give us a sense of just size and scale. Like, you know, Oracle is obviously a very large organization, but how many customers are we talking about um, when you're thinking about the application of this customer success philosophy and, and methodology that you've built across either North America or the entire world? Yeah, and certainly globally. Um, in the thousands of customers. And then as far as our CSM organization, you know, we're talking about just south of a thousand CSMs that we're coordinating all of our activity. And if you think about it, you know, customers are coming to Oracle to really solve, you know, some of their mission critical business processes, you know, really running and operating their business on the cloud using our applications in the cloud. And they're not just buying one solution. So when we think about the orchestration, it is, you know, making sure that we're maintaining the promise of product understanding which is super important, understanding the product that our customers are purchasing, you know, the roles that we serve. So heads of marketing, heads of sales, um, you know, certainly our leaders in IT, heads of finance, heads of HR, you know, those are different people, different leaders that we need to serve. And so certainly want our CSMs to understand the products that they're running and operating, but then also the leader themselves and what they're up against in terms of business challenges. And so, you know, we need to deliver consistently, but we also need with our customers that are buying more than one application, a coordination, whether it's regionally, you know, making sure that we have CSMs that are what we call pillar or product focused, coordinated, um, and making sure that we all understand what our customers are trying to accomplish, but then also globally sometimes. So we've also um, introduced our customer success executive level role that takes care of some of our largest, most complex customers to really help, again, make sure that we're delivering the promise of a consistent experience. Wow. Wow. That is uh, amazing, just the size and scale of the organization that you are responsible for. So excited to dig into some of that when we come back to that. But first, I want to go back, way back in the time machine, and I want to talk about the first time you got into a leadership position. Can you set the stage for us? What was the type of work you were involved in and how the opportunity come about? Sure, sure. I, and I will I'll phrase this. I think you were looking for the professional experience because I'm sure like many of us, we were called to leadership perhaps before we even got into the workforce. But that aside, that aside, um, it'd probably be good to describe, you know, my background is maybe a little untraditional for technology, meaning that I've spent, you know, a little less than half of my career in consumer packaged goods. And, you know, and how does that even relate? What does it even look like? You know, out of college, out of university, Uh, I was recruited into consumer packaged goods, and I was actually recruited into a management development track, which we'll talk about, um, which was exciting for me. You know, someone that's just starting off their career, I'm going to have mentoring and training and sponsorship to become a future manager. That was important. But then I also participated in an industry that was also transforming. And so throughout my career, I learned a lot about what we were trying to accomplish 
within a supply chain transformation. You know, at that point in time, it was about going paperless and helping our customers become more automated and really work with them closely as a business partner versus a transactional vendor. Also learned a ton about what it means to be, you know, data driven in our decisions and helping customers understand how they can optimize using, in that case, our products, which kind of seems strange when you think about consumer products, but it's very relatable. And so then, you know, as I exited that industry and was exploring opportunities within technology, it became very clear that early days of cloud, there were a lot of uh, similarities. Um, okay, we need to understand a customer model that isn't just, you know, uh, on an event basis, meaning I'm going to implement a customer, I'm going to support a customer. It needs to be end to end. How do we drive growth? How do we keep our customers? All these things were very transferable. So again, my early days actually knows we're in consumer packaged goods. And so uh, we can talk more about maybe some of those early leader roles. Well, I'm curious. Um, I want to come back to that, but I'm curious because you said you spent a lot of time in the CPG space and yep. some of those comments you just made, I had never made the connection between CPG and customer success before, but there's a really interesting thread there. Um, fascinating, probably discussion for another time yes. for us. <laughs> but <laughs> Definitely. when you said I was, uh, when I exited that industry and was looking at opportunities in technology, why the shift? Like you had a great career, things were going well in CPG. What drew you to the technology field? Yeah, and it probably has a lot to do with my last responsibility that I had, which was taking care of our entire Costco business globally. And it was interesting, you know, that 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 opportunity really changed my mindset and really caught the entrepreneurial bug, so to speak. Because if you think about Costco's business model in a limited SKU environment, they are looking for that next huge brand yeah. that they can develop. And even some of my involvement in consumer packaged goods, I, a funny project in my 20s, I developed a private label brand for the Albertsons chain and working with them to launch that brand. And as I started, you know, you know, and we've talked so much about strength finders yeah. and pursue your passion. And when I think about that experience, it really supercharged me and interests me in developing something new and launching it. And then working with Costco and just learning so much about what they're trying to do to take cost out of the system, adding member value through cost savings, but then developing brands. And we developed, if you can imagine, they were asking us to develop mango Pop-Tarts. I mean, imagine like that <laughs> initiative um, that we, uh, we, we didn't develop mango Pop-Tarts, but we did do a bit about uh, some private label, you know, ideas they had around cereal. Um, but but that was interesting because again, I caught the entrepreneurial bug and knowing that, you know, on the West Coast, if you got Microsoft and certainly Oracle in your backyard, you, you kind of start to think about maybe there's a new career for me outside hmm. of this. That's cool. All right. So we're we're coming back to that, but I do want to come <laughs> back to the first um, you know, managerial leadership position where you went from an individual yeah. contributor to now you were responsible for other people. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that situation was like. Absolutely. So this, I'm going to answer it a couple of different experiences, because as I mentioned a little bit ago, there was this promise of management. You know, I knew through whether it's, you know, things we experience in college or even before college, you know, you kind of have this in your, in your mind, like, I, I really do want to lead. I mean, I, I've been put in responsibility, you know, positions of you know responsibility in the past. And so that very much attracted me as I went into consumer packaged goods. But what I found in my first experience is just putting something on paper that says, you know, here's, you're going to be a future manager. It doesn't always equate to like success. And I didn't necessarily, my first management role actually wasn't a people role. It was one where I was coordinating analytics across our organization or our region, if you will. And I had a lot of responsibility to really coordinate with the field on how to best represent our products in market and analyze results, which was very important. And I probably didn't know at the time how important this would be for my entire career. But, but I kind of got the bug to go beyond that. And what I found was I needed to find mentors and sponsorship to help me move mm. beyond just an analyst role to actually get into people management and people leadership. And as I was looking at you know, opportunities within the current company I was working with, you know, I didn't see you know, my time horizons. You know, I was competitive, aggressive. You know, I want to move up the ranks. And so you know, I started networking, Nils. I started networking. And I found that with a, a different CPG company, um, I found, you know, folks that were like me that wanted to grow fast. I had a regional vice president who was super keen in bringing on young talent and developing us for the future. So to me, that was like a perfect combo. 
And what I really appreciate about him so much, even now, as I reflect back, is that he had the patience, he had the time, he really wanted to invest in folks that had been out of college for a few years to really develop you as a leader. So, you know, it didn't start off right away with me getting kind of handed the keys to a a big team car. It was really about, we're going to first, you know, have you manage summer interns. That was really the first, I guess, foray into managing people, Mm -hmm. you know, manage interns. Okay, great. Had that experience. And that was a bit about his, you know, track record of success. And then the next piece was, you know, manage a cross functional team, manage a cross functional team. You'll have a few people reporting to you. And we'll talk more about that because that also, I didn't appreciate at the time how important that would be to my career now. So hopefully uh, that gives you a little sense of how I got started with actually first actual leadership jobs. Yeah. And it's really interesting the approach that your regional vice president took because I don't hear that that often, honestly, Mm -hmm. and in all the conversations of this podcast, it does not come up very often where there is a concerted plan to develop leaders. Right. And uh, in the vast, you know, fast paced world that we all live in and have been in for a long time, it's kind of a, okay, we need a leader, go either hire or promote them from internally or go get them from outside, just fix the hole. Right. And it sounds like this leader had a vastly different experience. What do you think was um, the source of that? You know, his personal experience prior, his just belief in how to develop leaders. Did he share much of that with you as to why that was his approach? And it sounds really effective. Yeah, definitely part of his DNA, you know, definitely part of who he is as an individual and really kind of thinking, you know, paying it forward in terms of the organization that he wants to develop for the future. And he also had a really interesting philosophy, too, which also has been interesting just given, you know, where we stand in just war on talent. You know, his philosophy was he wanted to hire folks that he could really kind of maximize what we could accomplish in like two to five years, knowing he probably wouldn't keep us. He did not think about it that way. He thought about, you know, even though there was plenty of people in the company that got their gold watch after 50 years at the time, he's like, no, I want to, you know, definitely cultivate a team where we're going to be high growth, you know, kind of, kind of at a, at a mock speed that's different than the rest of the company, but I don't expect I'm going to keep you here. I think that you're going to go do more interesting things after we spend time together. And we'll talk about where that led to after I worked for him for a couple of years, but that was just his personal philosophy. But I will also tell you that I, Definitely think, and this is maybe a call to action for all of us as software, that a, a an industry that probably wasn't moving as fast as technology um, has been around longer, you know, 100 plus years. Uh, we had a lot, you know, the operating history of investing in future talent management. We didn't just throw people into manager jobs because they were great individual contributors. We <laughs> spent a lot of time grooming people, right? You know that. Uh, we spent a lot of time grooming people. We had courses people could take. Um, and we gave people time to be able to develop um, towards the future. So that was, you know, maybe a little bit also about the industry. Yeah. And that's I th- that's a really interesting point that, you know, the industries that have been around for longer than SaaS or longer than mm-hmm. software uh, have gone through all these pains, right? They probably went through all these pains 100 years ago <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> and trying right. to elevate and they learned and they evolved. And some of the largest firms in the world, you know, take this approach too. Um, and I think there's a lot that the especially the the startup and the you know early funded comp, early rounds of, of funding for companies can learn from that that yeah we are going at breakneck speed however there is it is necessary to put in some of those systems to develop for the longer term longer than just six months out in the future right, right? That's great. That's and exactly and that's right. I think that's a really excellent point and it's really cool to know that you've seen that in both CPG 100 year old industry and inside of SaaS, inside of you've worked for very fast growing startups and you've worked for one of the world's largest software companies. So you've seen that common thread across the board. Um, and that's, that's absolutely fascinating. Yes. It's, it's interesting to bend to the future several times in my career and what it looks <laughs> like when you go back in time to try to re-architect what you know the future is going to look like. That is very good. That's very good insight. Okay. So you come out of CPG and you start looking for opportunities in the technology space, as we talked about. Where did you land? And, and then we'll talk about the leadership journey from there. Absolutely. So I landed at a startup, unbeknownst to me, um, that would end up becoming a part of Salesforce, which is Jigsaw that became data.com. And, and it is a funny story because as I thought about you know, startups, gonna be given, again, coming from consumer packaged goods, the image I had in my mind is like that garage startup. Yep. And so, you know, you go to your, 
your, your, your family and say, this is what I'm going to do next. When they're used to seeing, you know, cereal boxes and snacks, you know, they know the companies you've worked for Mm -hmm. and like, you're going to go do what? You're going to go work for a startup? What? (laughs) Yeah, it was uh, quite a moment to be able to describe uh, why. (laughs) I can imagine. I, you know, and and that is, um, you know, there's, so you're going through this transition, uh, Mm -hmm. both from an industry perspective and translating your skills that you had from the CPG space into the startup world. And then you also have the family and the whole dynamic that comes on the back of that, which I've certainly been, <laughs> been on the receiving end of some of those interesting looks and questions yes. as well. It's fascinating. So how did you make the transition? Because a lot of people look at you know software technology or even customer success and say, well, I would love to be in that kind of field, or I would love to work for a technology company. I have this you know drive for mm. some reason or another. It sounds really interesting. You were able to successfully make that transition. How did you do that? So I'm going to go back to some of those kind of fundamentals of having someone that believes in you, that pushes you to do things greater than what you think you're capable of. Hmm. Meaning the individual that mentored me in that first leadership assignment saw that I was capable of doing more than maybe even what I saw in myself because he had been there, he had seen other people, he had perspective. And so, you know, once you, I think, have those experiences, Nils, even if you don't have it in your life right at that moment, and I know we'll talk more about like, what do I do now? But you kind of hold on to those, you know, Mm. those words. And so as I was, you know, soul searching about what I wanted to do next, and even though it may have sound risky, Um, I'll tell you about the leader that I got to know and what really helped me make that decision because I saw similarities in a leader that I knew would invest in me. And then meeting with Jim Fowler, who is the startup CEO of Jigsaw, this conversation we had in Silicon Valley was something like this. Catherine, I see what you're doing or what you've done in your track record. You know, once you've been in leadership, it changes everything. You think differently. I see this in you. I don't know exactly what the job's going to be, but I want to create a role around you because I think you can help my startup. Mark Benioff's doing something kind of interesting around what he's calling customer success. You probably don't know anything about this, but let me tell you, it sounds a lot like what you're doing or had done in consumer packaged goods. So I'm thinking that you can help us here. Again, I don't know what it will look like, but I'm going to wrap a role around your strengths and your capabilities. Nils, how amazing is that? To what, have a what leader year say, was this? What year was this that this conversation happened? This was 2000, what was it? Seven, oh, 2007, 2007. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That is absolutely yes. amazing. I mean, the, yes. the, I, I don't even know. It, Salesforce must have just barely introduced the concept of customer success, yes. or the words customer success, probably without a lot. I think it was the same year we got the iPhone. I think it was the same year the iPhone launched. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. That's right. Oh, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. So there's a common thread here of those leaders, some of them being the same, but that saw this piece in you that has had a transformational impact on you over your career. So how has that translated into your teams that you've led either, you know, at the early stage and the, you know, the smaller size, and then all the way up now, you're responsible for over a thousand people across the world in implementing this stuff. So how do you embody that going forward? Yeah, there's, there's an important piece here too, that I wanted to describe, which is allyship. And hopefully everybody listening in knows what that is. And I think if we were to equate what Dave Gregson at Ralston Purina back in the day did for me, it was allyship. And there's another leader that was super important when I worked at Kellogg's, um, also allyship. He saw in me a gap he had and said, you know, I think that Catherine could really help me really analyze our results. So we talk about, you know, previous skills and things that I had done and she's leading a team, but, but I need to have her in front of our CFO representing our business allyship. He had me fly out to Battle Creek mission in Michigan and join him on every quarterly business review, presenting results and having high visibility so that, again, the organization got to know me so that when future roles opened up, they knew my capabilities. They knew I had the head and the hand of executing business and again, allyship. And so when I think about that now, it's about, you know, there's a lot we can talk about here, but there's a a lot, a huge responsibility I have to be able to think about our talent and develop an organization for the future. 
you know, not just take current moment and time and look at openings, but where do we need to be as we grow? You know, I talked earlier about what the size and scale of Oracle looks like and customer success as a profession is not stagnant. And so what are the capabilities we have to develop? And then how do we, you know, we know that, that it's about having a, a diverse, you know, like multifaceted organization. It is the, the, the only way we can build out an organization and we have to challenge ourselves as leaders to really say are we doing enough to be able to have folks that are lower in the organization you know who, who's kind of missing from the picture in our board meetings who's missing from the picture in our team meetings and how do we really look at our talent and develop and then also what skills are missing I mean we just as a leader I have to challenge my team to be thinking that way and we use talent review as an opportunity to be able to do that Nils and again it's about sponsoring and giving people access assignments you know, there's there's a lot of work that we can do. Me not having the spotlight. I, I'd like to think Nils on future podcasts. It's not you and I talking together. It's actually one of the people on my team talking to you about what we're doing. It's giving Absolutely. folks an opportunity to be able to build their own personal brand and and be able to be visible, and that helps grow their career. Because I've personally seen it myself. Yeah, well, that's that's wonderful, and I think your sentiment of not just planning for now, right? And in the mm -hmm. culture that we're in and the vast majority of the time that we're dealing with the here and now, they've yeah. got problems that have to be solved. However, tell me about how far into the future you're looking when you think about talent development and you think about mm -hmm. what is, you know, this even look like at Oracle in the future? How are we talking three years, five years, 20 years? Well, how far <laughs> into the future are we looking? I don't know in technology if you can look 20 years into the future, um, I would love to. I, I think we did that in consumer packaged goods. It's probably a lot easier to do. Fair. Um, but but definitely with the speed of change, I think it's more of you know the agility of knowing that we're going to need to pivot and having the ability to look in different ways because we you know we don't know you know what technology is even going to be needed. But we do know enough, I think, about the next you know two years to know mm -hmm. um, that our future is data. Our future is being you know more proactive than even we are today what we call it, what we um, really phrase as this whole kind of shift left mindset, meaning that tasks and things we do today need to become more automated. And it's not to replace the work we're doing, but to up level ourselves. And then what does up leveling really look like and investing in our people to be able to make sure that they can then take insights, be more, again, data driven as they think analytically about the business that you know, the customers are working with. Um, but, you know, again, being able to be more advisory and helping our customers do more, uh, you know, I think about everything that we're trying to harness in general in technology means that we've got a very fascinating road ahead of us as we think about what the role will be. That is. And I, you are, I know, a the source of the quote, without, uh, there is no customer success without employee success. That's right. Can you, can you, and I think it tails on, dovetails on what we were just talking about there, but can you share the sentiment behind where that came from and what you're really hoping mm. that people truly understand when they hear that, what can be conceptually simple, but often involves an awful lot behind the scenes? Well, for those that are tuning in that are in customer success management, um, I think this is where I would argue we have a little bit of a leg up but we have to take action and make it real. Meaning if you think about the fundamentals of how we as CSMs manage customers on a life cycle basis, we're here for life and we have context, it's personalized. You know, what our customers need that are new and working with you looks way different than those have been working with you for a number of years. And if we think about being proactive, you know, how are we leveraging data and insights? You know, how are we making sure that it's personalized? Again, who are we working with? What is their unique goals and needs? And then, you know, prescriptive, how are we actually taking programs? How are we actually taking um, best practice guidance and really marrying that with the bespoke needs of our customers? You know, obviously I'm in a nutshell, there's a lot of work we're doing in customer success, but what if we were to take that same model and think about our people? My argument is our people are no different. And that's my point about having a leg up. If we think about the life cycle approach of employees and employees being successful, then my argument is we as people managers and leaders are employee success managers. Mm -hmm. So we need to be thinking about what our, what our customers are, our people, and what our people need at every stage of their journey, which is different. What are their personal needs? Uh, and how are we thinking about developing them? And then what are the signals and data that we would know that we've got employees at risk? You know, it was somebody told me once that, gosh, Catherine, it seems like we're spending a lot of time looking at customers who are at risk. Gosh, wouldn't it be great if you look at our employees that are at risk? Because kind of the same thing, like we throw money at a customer when they're about ready to walk out the door and hope they stay. I would argue a lot of people do the same thing with our people. If we're way ahead of it, hopefully we wouldn't have that happen. 
So that's what I mean by employee success. But then it's not like we think about it, like just being customer centric as a culture we know is critical to driving customer success. Same thing with people. We have to be passionate about people, but culture isn't enough. We need to have what I mentioned ago, a framework to be able to execute against our really people roadmap and making sure that we are holding ourselves accountable as leaders and managers to deliver against this promise of being people centric or passionate about our people and developing them. That's so well put, just perfectly summed up basically <laughs> everything that everybody should follow in thinking about employee development uh, from longer term than just today, right? And and the employee, you know, success, you are responsible for that in the same way you are for your customers, whether you're in the field of customer success or not. Early mm-hmm. warning signs, data, yes. analysis, like reviews of where you stand in relation to the goals. It's all the same. That's, it is. That's awesome. It I is. love it. I love it. <laughs> okay. So when you joined Oracle, it was a shade over, what are we, six plus years in? Yeah, that's Oracle right. Oracle tenure. Okay. Yeah. So when you joined Oracle, uh, one of your first uh, stops was in Oracle Marketing Cloud. And this was a big leadership challenge, I know, because I had the good fortune of working with yes. you on some of this. Um, but I want to share, if you could, what you walked into and how, like, what was Oracle Marketing Cloud, number one? And two, mm-hmm. what was the challenge from a leadership perspective, given that scenario? Because I think it's a really incredible insight into how to do some of this big picture leadership stuff at a very, very large organization that was in the middle of a massive transformation. Absolutely. Yes, you know this well. So when I walked in the door, we had just acquired, I think, our fifth company to form the marketing cloud. And at that time, it really was, you know, Responses, Eloqua, Blue Kai, Maximizer, a few others that certainly formed the marketing cloud. And, you know, I joined at a time where we had almost exited all kind of operational integration timelines. And so, you know, the companies are acquired, you know, you go through that time period. And, you know, for the most part, a lot of that initial kind of what I call thrash that just happens. It doesn't matter what company is acquiring what company. There's just a time period where it's just, you know, you got to get a lot done, um, getting everybody, you know, on the right payroll system, all that stuff. All of that was done. But when I entered the scene and I talked to, at the time, Kevin Ackroyd, who was our GM of the marketing cloud, and he brought me in to really with the challenge of, you know, we've acquired all these companies, but we hadn't reconciled the customer success model. Mm-hmm. you know, effectively five different models, five different models. And, you know, you think about that and you got to know some of the team Mills. I mean, folks that all came in from acquisition and, and it, it was kind of reminded me of our back in the day, customer success supper clubs, where we had a lot of leadership talking about the practice of customer success, but no real guidance on how to come together as a team. So that was my, my role and my goal is to bring these five companies together. You know, we want the same model, we want the same mantra. We want the same uh, culture, um, goals, all of it, all of it, so that we're not just five different companies, you know, kind of cohabitating and all working nicely together. But to our customers, you can imagine, I mean, the first thing is, how do you get everybody aligned to that? Well, it's about the customer, really. It's not about each one of us individually. Our job in customer success is to help customers be successful. And if we do not figure this out, it will hurt our customers. And then number two, it'll hurt our people because again, we're just not doing right by them if we're not figuring this out. And I think the leaders got that for sure. I mean, they, they definitely rallied around this, but then how do you do it? I mean, that's just the tough stuff. And so, you know, as you know, Nils, we, you know, how you do this, you have to have a framework. And, you know, I put on my consulting hat more than anything um, in the early days, you know, I told the leadership team, you got to continue to execute as you're executing. My job is not to do your job. I need you in the field. We need to be running our teams as they are. I'm going to be working on the transformational swim lane. And we did a number of workshops that was centered around really, you know, we called uh, the, the, the four P's. We need to, first of all, establish the purpose. Mm-hmm. It was key. Nils, we worked together on that. You know, what is the purpose of customer success with an Oracle Marketing Cloud? And we to get there, we had to unpack what it used to be, what it used to be. And, you know, it was important cathartic exercise of really laying out what companies were before. And then how do we then align if everybody agrees that kind of elevator pitch of what we are, you know, what will be effectively, you know, what does that look like? What's our brand? You know, what's our uh, logo? You know, how do we think of this culturally? Um, So that you get everybody starting to really think about our purpose. This is our t-shirt we wear. Now this is our new identity Um, and getting everybody involved with that because then the rest of it kind of falls out from there. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't have, you know, 
organizational design or training until you really all in lockstep know this is the purpose. You know, for example, we know in customer success, the purpose of customer success could be, you know, we want to maximize um, um, expansion or we want to maintain renewals. Well, that's a very fine purpose. But if you have people that don't know how to do that work, um, that's going to be a problem. Or if leadership doesn't, senior leadership, executive leadership doesn't agree, well, then that's going to be a problem too. So even before we did any additional design around, okay, what are our people in terms of who we're going to hire for this role? What's our processes? What's the platform or the tools we're going to use to orchestrate? We needed to get executive leadership aligned to, yep, this is the purpose of what we're going to be doing in customer success. It's going to be proactive. We're going to be advisory. You know, these are the things we're going to do. Um, and that really then fueled the rest of the piece to get done. But I think that's the foundational work that has to be done before you move over into anything else. And that's uh, so well put that you can, and it was a few hundred people, if I remember correctly, it, across it was. different companies. It was. Right? Mm -hmm. And so when you think about, all right, I have a few hundred people coming from five plus different cultures, five different ways of seeing the world. And we have to standardize on one and get everybody in the same boat, run the same direction. And no one of them is the best. They're all just, you know, different ways of looking at the problem. And the one thing you did was define a single sentence, one sentence. That's it. That was the most powerful part of that transformation, as you said. And it is incredible to see what happened after that, because once that purpose was nailed, everything else then became clear. Well, if that's the purpose, then we have to do all these other things in order to really live and fulfill that purpose. And that is just, you know, incredible leadership across, again, hundreds and hundreds of people who had never come together in this kind of way before and was highly effective with OMC. Yes, yes, yes. So after OMC, um, I know you've gone on to do other roles and take on other responsibilities within Oracle. Tell us a little bit about the progression from that work you did with OMC to what you're doing and responsible for today. How did that evolve from a leadership perspective? Absolutely. So I think knowing that this goes back to being in, you know, living in the future, you know, is, is exciting. Having lived in the future is exciting. And I think the tough stuff is um, around change management of getting everybody to join you on this road to the future and not see folks. And, you know, granted, I'll be pragmatic. Of course, not everybody's going to be there for every twist and turn, but I think the consistency in message and what we're trying to accomplish and knowing that the company really supports me in that effort has been, I think, foundationally important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, transformational change is not easy, certainly, but, but knowing that there is agreement from certainly the, the most senior offices at Oracle as to what the role of customer success is has been critical. You know, we've definitely experimented a lot in terms of model design, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. Many startups do. Many mid-sized companies do. That's the point. I think you have to always be in, in somewhat of an agile state because you're going to be making modifications to serve the needs of your customers. But if you at your core have a purpose, a purpose and a mission of what we're trying to accomplish, and that's always you know your North Star, I think that just helps in the journey. So that's been something you know, really, really important and foundational in terms of a lot of the leadership work I've done. But then also um, what we certainly found in the early days of just forming the marketing cloud, that just, that still remains true. You know, anytime you are trying to do hard work like this, getting folks together to really orient yourself around the North Star of serving your customer, it's, you can't argue that that's not the right thing to be doing. It just kind of level sets everything. And, and probably, and the same thing on the employee side. Right. Yes. If it takes the individual who is in that room discussing this out of the equation, it's not what I want. I want. I want. It's what is going to be best for my customer, whether that's an external customer paying you a licensed subscription or that's an external customer to your meeting who is employed by your organization and working to deliver against your goals and ultimately your purpose. Right. That's right. That's exactly and right. That is incredibly powerful, you know, just from that ability to take a step back. And it's not, we don't have all the answers. However, if we think in the context of other, who our customer really is, again, internal, external doesn't matter, and figure out, okay, what's the framework that I need to apply in order to ensure that they are successful, then that changes the game. Right? No, it really, it really does. It really does. And I think, you know, Another important lesson learned, a couple of things that I thought a lot about when, you know, when we were chatting about, you know, discussing the session together today, a couple of things that I think we know as leaders, but 
but need to be underscored is, you know, really thinking about um, kind of the communication and the EQ mm -hmm. around what, even though you center everyone around your customer and you can't argue that that's not the right thing, but also thinking about, to your point, the internal customer, part of that passionate about people and people centric as much as you can, you know, what will your people go through as you're driving change and how can you help them on the road? Like I said, like that transformational road, how do you help them on their journey? And I think a lot of that has to do, it has to be around just trying to understand their point of reference, yeah. um, trying to figure out how to make it easier so that they can consume change. You know, I would argue I'm, I'm learning every day. You know, there's always going to be moments where you reflect say, oh, that was a little too much or that wasn't enough. And it's not easy. You know, it's hard. Not everybody consumes change the same way, yeah. but it is important to know that that's a huge, huge part of what you as a leader and driving these types of, you know, huge charters have to be thinking about. So on that change management note, um, you've driven an awful lot of change inside an organization going from a, through a massive shift to, from enterprise software to SaaS. Um, so what are the, what advice would you give to mm -hmm. another leader, regardless of discipline or domain or whatever, inside of an organization that's going through some kind of transformation, whatever it is, um, when it comes to change management, based on all the incredible experience that you've had? So I might take the answer just in a little different way, because I'll tie it back to some earlier experiences. Uh, hopefully folks remembered when I said, you know, kind of, kind of underscore this or bookmark this. My first, one of my first leadership roles was actually a cross-functional leader mm -hmm. role. And I would argue that skill set is key to what you just asked. So what do I mean by that? I think we, we as leaders, we need to realize that driving change doesn't mean I'm just going to change the people and you know, I'm just going to change what I own and that's what I'm going to control. A absolutely. You have to take care of your own house. Got to get your own house in order. But when we're talking about the changes that, you know, certainly I've been involved with here at Oracle and really, you know, coordinating what we need to do across customer success, it's cross-functional leadership. It's knowing how to execute and get stuff done with teams that don't work for you mm -hmm. and knowing how to work with different organizations and help them see your charter and have it be a part of their charter. Um, I'm not saying it's easy to do. It's not easy to do, but it is something that can be done. And it's important thing to figure out how to develop skills there, because more often than not, we're measured by, you know, in customer success, can we accomplish these things? And sometimes accomplishing the future means we're going to need to help. We're going to need help to develop tools. We're going to need help putting together data. We're going to need assistance collaborating across an ecosystem. We're going to need marketing help. We're going to need finance help which means you need to develop relationships with all of these leaders and figure out how we can get, again, back to that North Star of our customer, how do we better serve our customers becomes obviously important for everybody to do, but then how do you break it down so that part of their goals for the year involve your goals so you can execute mm -hmm. against you know, work that you can do together? Beautifully put. The relationships are at the core, and this I ties back perfectly to your previous point about the power of communication and having a high level of emotional intelligence and not waiting to build relationships until you need one. And regardless of if you're in customer success or finance or marketing, the world today is so interwoven with all the disciplines across our various companies and even across companies, our partners and our customers too, that that skill set is of paramount importance to your ability to succeed as a leader in the future because things are just going to get more complicated. There are no more silos that can really right. exist anymore, thanks to the world. And that's a good thing. But what it does is shine a huge light on the importance of building those relationships internally um, as much as we focus on building them externally. That's exactly right. Cool. That's so um, kind of bring it at home here. What advice would you give to somebody listening who is it? whatever stage of career they're at, but maybe they've never experienced what you experienced with some of your early leaders who saw incredible potential and talent in you and helped you helped pave the way for you to one, see that and appreciate that and take advantage and kind of nurture that leadership over time. So, you know, sometimes some people are in situations where that's not possible and the people they work for just don't have that particular viewpoint or mindset or skill set. So a lot of more of their leadership development kind of falls on them. What advice would you give them based on everything that you know 
for how to grow and develop their leadership skills. Yeah, definitely. It's, a, it's, it's I think it's an important moment to take control of your future. You can control your future, right? You can control the outcomes. It doesn't matter who you're working for. And, and you know, certainly work for great leaders. I've worked for leaders that maybe weren't great. Um, it doesn't matter. Really, really doesn't matter. It's about not feel, calling, maybe falling victim to your circumstance, yeah. but really seeing that you have the power to do something about it. You have the power to change. You have the power to grow. And what do I mean by that? That's more like tactically, what would you do? Well, I've done this you know, yes, you can seek out mentors. Maybe you don't even know, but but I would call it now more so for me, a personal board of directors. Like Nils, you're on my board. Yep. We talk and it's, you know, kind of seeking people out, but but being, you know, like interview people. Don't take the first, like oh, this person I'm going to add on my board, but, but intentionally think about who are the people that are going to push you out of your comfort zone, um, that believe in you, that see things in you, that will make you do bigger things than you're doing today. And that's the part about you have it within you. You can do something about it, but but don't just get people that are like, oh, you know, you're doing great. You know, kind of a cheerleader that says, yeah, you know, everything's wonderful. Get some people out there that challenge you. That say, you know, here's some things that I observe in you that you could be doing more, better, different, or you're not walking through a big enough door. Let me tell you, you need to walk through a better door or a bigger door. You can do it. Um, let me tell you, though, what you probably will want to do to get ready for that. Um, you know, certainly people that will set you up for success, not just say that you're amazing. Go for that, you know, CEO job and, you know, you don't even know what you need to develop. Like, that's not helpful. But that would be my advice is that, you know, you've got the power to do something about it. You know, take advantage of that power. And then doing something about it is my advice would be really start to interview a personal board of directors, you know, that, that team's going to help you develop for, you know, maybe your next job or even future jobs down the road. Personal board of directors, one incredibly powerful potential, very specific thing that you can do if you're listening to this straight from Catherine and all of her incredible experience. That was absolutely wonderful. All right, Catherine. Well, it has been a blast talking leadership with you as always. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and your wisdom. I appreciate it. I know this audience has taken away an awful lot, as have I every time we talk. So thank you so much. And I will talk to you soon. Uh, Nils, thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers.